sliding mod logic, sliding mod logic puzzle. Uh, Zingo, uh, you guys probably don't have kids, but if, if you're around four year old, this is like an awesome game. But we do logic puzzles. That's the main thing. Solitaire chess, chocolate fix. It's a sort of a Sudoku-like logic puzzle. Tip over, spatial. You move it around. These are I, I don't know whether you call them tabletop games in your parlance. Laser maze game that um, you play with lasers and deer, so it's kind of cool. Uh, Gravity maze, which is like a, a marble run, except it's a brain teaser puzzle associated with agile, and really cool. Um, and then, in addition to like fun games that are good for your mind and just good for fun to play, I've also been trying to push the envelope for quite some time on games that are both fun but kind of more educational or more kind of a thing. How do you balance between think and fun? Push it as far as you can in the think direction, still having fun. So, Math Dice teaches time tables and exponents, but it's like blast. I'll talk more about this game. Uh, Balance Beams, it's designed for five year olds, but on the cover we say teaches powerful math and physics principles, which is, uh, it does, it's kind of cool. Circuit Maze is like uh, teaches bypass circuits and things like that in the form of a logic puzzle uh, maze. So, and then Code Master is a, a game that teaches coding principles. Um, so that's kind of, that's like a quick thing of who we are and what we do to make fun. Um, so when I, when I was thinking about how, what I wanted to do with this talk, I know you guys are entrepreneurs, I know you're artists, I know you're creatives, I know you're gamers, um, and we got a lot in common with that, and that's totally awesome. Um, on the other hand, I'm, you know, I, I, we started our company in 1985, we made plastic games that we sell in toy stores, uh, which I think is a little different business model. So I didn't want to give kind of a, try to compose my business model talk. So what I decided to do was to give a talk on kind of just a set of stories about the things that I have been most passionate about and most interesting over the years and just kind of have some fun with it. So what I'm hoping to do is entertain you. Um, I'm hoping maybe I can challenge you some and maybe I can even inspire you. But basically I'm gonna talk about half an hour and then we can pick it up in questions or whatever from there. So let me start with the, the Think Fun mission stage. My wife and I came up with this basically as we started the company. This was like the first founding thing that we ever came up with. And that is to translate the brilliant ideas of the craziest mathematicians, engineers, and inventors into simple toys for boys and girls around the world. Now that's pretty cool, but when we were starting a business and kind of didn't have anything, like there's a question about like, how do we come up with this and you know, sort of how do we think we can make this stick? And so the story of that, of course, goes back to my youth and there's something in that. And I want to tell you a little bit about that. So this picture here, um, there are three people in it. Uh, the guy on the left is my dad, uh, Al Ritchie, who's Bell Labs engineer. And of course, he was one of the really crazy people, and you know, everybody's influenced by their dad, that was great. But what I want to talk about are the other two guys in, in this picture. Uh, there's Bill Keister, Mr. Keister in the center, and then my brother Dennis on the right. And you probably know, some of you probably know my brother Dennis from the Meat. He's famous in the world. He created C and co-created Unix. So, uh, you know, he goes, he's kind of deep in the whole world there. This is a picture of him in, 19, in 2011 accepting the Japan Prize. So he's, you know, he's kind of up there. But for me, he was my older brother, uh, 13 years older than me. And when I was a little kid, I really admired him. He was like this awesome guy. And I, um, I, you know, it's great. Um, by the, you know, 13 years old, he went off to college and then grad school. But so by the time I was 10 or so, I would just see him when he and there's this really funny story. In our family, we have kind of a creative family. And when, in 1965, I think it was, um, the sibling, my brother John, Lynn, and I got together, and we decided we would come up with an alter, an alter ego for our family identity. We would call ourselves the Legion of Super Diseases. <laughs> we come up with this whole cartoon thing. And, like, you know, it was fun. It was a kid. It was great. And Dennis was always kind of aloof from this and uh, everything. But he came home, and he got into this. And all of a sudden, we discovered he had a hidden talent, which is like he was an amazing cartoonist. And so he did like cartoons for the whole family in the Legion of Super Diseases. This is my sister, we call her now. Um, and it was like totally awesome. And so I was like, I gotta get together with my brother on this. So the next time he came home for Thanksgiving, I convinced him to sit down, I got him a typewriter and I sat next to him and I dictated, started dictating a series of um, Legion of Super Disease novels. And he would just type into the keyboard and I got his attention. And not only would do that, he illustrated the covers for me. Uh, he illustrated the you know, chapter headings. Uh, he did this incredible artwork. It was like amazing. I'm a 10 year old kid and I got this guy making this amazing artwork. Um, he did a biography of me. And uh, here, this was on the back of the first one. And Bill Ritchie is one of the. And 
the second sentence says, uh, he makes his home in the lower elementary canal. Now, I don't know if you guys get that joke, but I was 10 and I got it then. And um, I didn't think it was particularly funny. Uh, what it means is, I'll crawl up my back. So that's <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, well, this is kind of a lesson learned from this. Is if you're going to be dealing with amazingly creative people, and you want to basically not worry about the slings and arrows that come with it, you just ride it as it goes. So it was an amazing time in Venice. Okay. So the other guy that I want to talk about is Bill Keister, who is my father's dear friend, who's a Bell Labs guy. And Mr. Keister was this amazing person uh, who kind of was this amazing place in time. I don't think anybody knows this, but I'll tell you the story. In the summer of 1937, he was a member of technical staff working at Bell Labs when Claude Shannon came and brought his master's thesis on information theory using Boolean algebra and how that could become a logical system that could become much more powerful than just the switching circuit. And like, if you go back into the history books, you'll know that 1937, Claude Shannon coming to Bell Labs was like a big seminal moment. And Mr. Keister was a guy that the senior management people called out at the end of that summer and said, Keister, there's something really important here. You've got to come up with something good that demonstrates the principles here. And so he sat down and he got to work on it. He spent about a year and he developed a perfect, developed a tic-tac-toe machine using Boolean algebra code. You know, just like it had never been done before. It's like the first instance ever in the history of the world. And it took a while. It was after World War II. But the lab sent it out to a, a fabricating shop and made three or four of these things. And this is a tic-tac-toe machine from 1937, based on thought about 1937, that plays a perfect game, and AT&T demonstrated that around the country in the late 40s and 1950s. It was sort of like, this is the coming of the future. Um, Mr. Keister, one of the things that he did was he invented uh, mechanical puzzles that sort of expressed what he did as a, you know, in his thinking. He did wooden wire ones, um, incredible uh, artistry that he had. And his pride and joy was the puzzle on the left called the hexadecimal but he did these things. When I was a little kid, my mom would like commission him to make a half dozen and she'd get them and give them to us as a kid. So I was playing with these things when I was a kid. So Mr. Keyser was kind of like, you know, my brother Dennis and Mr. Keyser were the role models for our mission statement with this sort of thing. Um, the last thing I got to show you about him is he had this lifelong dream. He could also sew and do things. He decided at some point he wanted to make a three legged pair of pants. And he said, I'm going to make this pair of pants, I'm going to fold it up, I'm going to put it into a trunk in the attic, and then I'm going to go and dock it. You know, when my great grandkids come and find this attic and open it up, and they say, I knew Uncle Bill was funny, he was kind of crazy, but I didn't know he was that crazy. And then he finally did it. Uh, he followed through on these things, which was pretty amazing. So when we started our company, we went to Mr. Keister and said, Can we start it with using your puzzles? And Think Fun, called Binary Arts originally, was founded around Mr. Now the fact, I mean, those are pretty amazing connections, but that didn't mean that we were going to have a good business. These people weren't business people. We, we, we had a reason to get into it. We were in the real estate industry. We wanted to get the hell out of that, so we started. We didn't know what we were doing. And at the beginning, I mean, these are kind of cool, but they weren't commercial and they didn't sell very well. And the first five years of our business were really kind of a slog. Uh, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to start a business and be persevering. But by around 1990, we had plastic puzzles and we had better packaging. Session in 1989, but then in 1990 things started breaking through, and the decade of the 90s was like a completely different space. What was happening in the early 90s was there were stores like Sharper Image and Nature Company and Natural Wonders and Learning Smith that were just starting out. The whole real estate market was changing, upscale malls were coming in, and there was a whole new character where what people wanted was things that were fresh and new and different and, uh, and just interesting, and very different. I had hired a guy by that time who was a really creative designer who had all kinds of talents. And I realized, just like with my brother, that I, this was like an amazing opportunity. Uh, you know, we had more and more inventors, and we had this guy. And so I, I just want to show you a couple of projects from the 90s that we did um, that are pretty fun and pretty fun. So uh, one of the products that was out in the early 90s was this one thing called Happy Do. It was kind of simplistic looking, you wanted to be more sophisticated, but it was made out of EDA foam. An EDA foam was really great because you could just stamp it and you can get a, you know, a product out of it. You don't need tooling, you don't need sophisticated stuff. So if you can come up with something like that, it's profitable and it's fast to market and everything. But 
you need to make it fun and cool. So I, I said to this, my guy Steve, okay, I want to do something in the EBA, but what are we going to do? We found an inventor who came up with a series of uh, EBA puzzles that can interlock into sort of strange architectural shapes. And I said, Steve, what can you do with this? He said, well, we can market it as mystery shapes and make it kind of a cool thing and make it like green or something. I said, you know, that, that's good. Let's go that direction. So we tightened it up and it started looking pretty good. I said, yeah, let's keep going with that. Decided to do four of them together if you want. He said, that looks pretty good. He tightened it up. Now we're looking. This is not a handsome looking thing. But he was like, you know, we have the doves flying. And he's like, you know, I think I can do more with it. Maybe we should think about it as like a sort of a, you know, an Asian Oriental type theme. So we'll go with mystery shapes in this direction. And then how about if we make it a, you know, call it jade mystery shapes. We call it make them green. And he tightened that up. Want to go in that direction? No, he's got more ideas. How about mystery tombs? You go to the Egyptian theme and make it like these things are old sarcophagus. And it was like, by that time, I was like, you know, you're going way too far, so why don't we just tighten this back up? So he goes back into a normal, normal thing, but instead of the doves, now we got the black crow. He's kind of a, uh, he's got kind of a personality to him. But you know, it's like, okay, that's a good direction. So he tightened himself into mystery shapes, and bang, he got three foam products. That Brought to market from 1993 or 1994. And it was like, it was an amazing experience going through this because it reminded me of I'm like 10 years old with my brother, um, just riding really incredibly creative people. So this, this is fun because there's some cool artwork here. But the next example I'm going to give is kind of more, not more serious, but more important, shall we say, uh, which is Rush Hour and how Rush Hour came to be. Rush Hour is like the most important. Kind of the backbone of our company. It's an awesome product. Um, when it first launched, you may remember it from when you were kids. The, the first product, the first packaging had a guy, you know, getting out of traffic and going, "I'm out here," <laughs> and that's where we started. Um, we had a family. We had an inventor, you know, another one of our wacky inventors. This was like the most famous puzzle inventor in Japan, not Yano Shinohara. Um, when he brought it to us, it looked like this. It was Tokyo Parking, and the inside of it. So my guy Steve was really creative, but I was always looking for new, different designers with different ideas. And I heard about this guy who had some really pretty good stuff, so I sent it out to him and said, what can you do? Can you come up with something? And he looked at me and said, okay, Japanese inventor, it's a really hard puzzle. How about if we like play up this traffic, it's a Japanese guy, really agonizing this. So, yeah, we'll, go, we'll go with this kind of puzzle. Um, bad traffic, you're stuck in traffic and you've got to get out. We could put this kind of guy in the thing. It was like a pot, you know, like a happy face. I'm not asking. And it was like, you know what? That is not really going to go. We're not going to do it that way. So, probably the most important, I, I'm not artistic, but, you know, I'm on top of this stuff. And this is probably the most important memo I ever wrote. I, I sent this to Steve, and I said, we're not doing that. What we need is an empowering kind of message that shows the grit and determination of you making good your escape. You've got to have a hero here, not just somebody who's agonizing. And I gave it to Steve, and he said, okay, how about something like this? And I was like, yeah, okay, let's just start. And I was like, well, oh, wait a minute. And uh, Steve had done this, which is the place um, So I was like, no, we're not having a Japanese drawing. <laughs> so we switched it over, and he moved it into an Irish drawing. And I was like, okay, well, we're going to do that. <laughs> but let's tighten that up. So then he became a more friendly cat, and then he put some color on it. And then it was like, the guys, I'm so happy.
And then you had the dot com crash, and then you had uh, coming into the 2000s, you had 9 uh, 11 and all that kind of stuff. The whole world kind of changed. But just about that time, I said, okay, so what I'm going to do is back myself off. I'll still be you know, running the company, engaged in it. But I've got to get refreshed. Because what I want to do is start thinking about how we can use games for a more explicitly educational purpose. So we can teach, actually teach learning and doing something good. Um, but in order to do that, I had to figure out what that meant. And work, that meant working with kids. And it just so happened that my kids were, at that time, just getting ready to go into middle school. And uh, they went to a private school called Burgundy Farms Country Day and were big into parent volunteers. And so as a middle school, going into middle school, that meant I had a big opportunity to come in as kind of a parent volunteer. I don't feel like the go-to parent volunteer because everybody loves the game business and games are a good way to go for school. So that's my son Mike, um, at about that age. He's, uh, he's the younger one. Uh, but anyway, this is this is what I was thinking about how can I engage with this level. Um, so the first thing is that, um, here, I'm going to back up a second tell this story. So even as I was coming into sixth grade, the first thing I got contacted by a group of parents who previously had been in charge of the game section of the fall fair at Burgundy Farm School. And basically they were burned out and tired and they didn't want to do it anymore and they saw me as fresh blood. And they were like, you've got to take over this thing here. And I was, for me, this is what I want. I was like, chance to work with kids, chance to do games, chance to do stuff. Yes, I'm in. So we had a meeting, they handed all the equipment over to me, and that was that. But at the end of the meeting, one of the parents said, you know, I gotta tell you this thing, which is, you can't trust the kids. I just what? And they were like, okay, so when, you, you're, you're gonna get a classroom of kids to be volunteers for this program, you're gonna get a classroom of parents to be volunteers. They're not gonna be the same, it's just like the parents and the kids. And they're gonna help you run the games, but if you put the kids in charge, But you know that was that was the advice that I got. So I had a chance to like do some cool stuff with games. I mean, if you got a chance to like do a bunch of games from scratch with a bunch of kids, would you be into it? I was. I was really psyched for this. So we did things like there was the old you know milk bottle you know throw the baseball and how many milk bottles the kids throw and that was one of the games that we came. Out. So I went out and bought a canvas. I took it into art class. We had the kids do artwork and get involved that way. Uh, somewhere I can't even remember where. Like, how do we make a game out of like throwing tissues, you know, toilet paper, or basketball? We put it up on a thing and that became a game. Why not? You know, kids thought that. Um, this is like, there was this old thing that kind of didn't work very well where you took lollipops out of a thing and it was a brat. There was a color on the bottom and you put it in a brat. So I went out to Home Depot. I got foam insulation, the big pink stuff and sheets, cut it up, glued it together. Took a butcher knife and cut it into a strawberry and a mushroom and something else, and had the kids paint it. And you know, we did you know, some sweating, whatever. I mean, so it became this really attractive thing. Everybody got into it, and it became like one of the most popular events in the program. And then my personal favorite, we did the Barney launch. Um, I got a friend to make a, a, a you know, a, not a trampoline, whatever you call it. Yeah. Is that yeah. a, a trebuchet? And so the little kids loved it because it was Barney, and the older kids loved it because you could toss them into a volcano. Uh, and it was a big hit. It was, it was just really cute. The, uh, that's my son Sam there on the, on the left. Uh, um, and here's another shot of Barney. And of course, uh, prizes is a big part of all of it. And I didn't, I'm not going to tell you all the stories about prizes, but I will say Oriental Trade played a big role in it. <laughs> but I learned an awful lot about gamification from just getting involved in these prizes. So what we did, we had parents. And I got them at the end of the, uh, the, the fair to tally up all the um, all the tickets, and we knew because of how many tickets and this and that, we could do a lot of statistics on it. And I put together spreadsheets um, of the tickets sold, the number of plays, the performance of the tickets sold, and things. And then I went back in and I did some uh, uh, workshops with the kids afterwards. And we sat down and we talked about basically, you know, we did time and motion studies to figure out what how efficiently the games were used, and we figured out games made the most money and this and that. We talked about the goals and the mission of the whole fair. And the, the mission was two things. It was fundraising for one, and then the other was community involvement. And one of them meant you tried to make as much money as you could. And 
the other was she tried to make this lease money she could because she wanted it to be free for the community. And so we talked about balancing the goals and getting involved in the sub games that did this and how. And looked at it all as a statistic. And the kids got really into it. It was an awful lot of fun. And you know, the funny thing about it is that uh, I did this for six years and kept evolving it. And after the third year, we were doing one sort of you know, powered out with the kids and talking. One of the kids raised their hand. And he said, you know, I gotta say something. <laughs> and cheap, and, you know, and it was like amazing. It was like a complete switch around. The kids, once they were invested in and believed in the games and believed in the whole mission, they were like much more fanatic than parents. It was, it was this awesome thing. All right, so the second story I want to tell from this is, again, when uh, Sam, my older one, got into sixth grade, that December, there was a design and math game workshop at this school. And um, they pulled me in as a parent. But um, it was this really cool thing where the kids had to invent a game, a tabletop style game, which was like 2000, I think, or something. And so Sam uh, went in and he invented a game called Dice Mania. And it was this cute little game uh, that, you know, it was like five dice and you do math, and it's, it was great. And, uh, spoiler alert, it became our math dice game later. But at the time, I didn't know, and it was just like five dice, and it was my own kid, and I was doing this just kind of fun. So, you know, I didn't really do anything other than we play with it at the kitchen table. And, um, but then, uh, oops, sorry. three years later, uh, Mike gets into sixth grade, the younger one. And by this time, the teacher is on sabbatical, and the Inventa Game Workshop, they tell me that I'm going to come in and I'm going to run the whole thing as the parent volunteer. So I go in, and I do this, and I'm, it's kind of a long story, but I expose the kids to Dice Mania as an example. They had a great time playing it, all they wanted to do was play it. We got through the workshop, and then all through January, we kept going, teaching them the game. My son Sam, by this time, had moved to a new school, Murray, which was in the city. And Murray had asked me to come and do some stuff. So I organized a uh, tournament between Burgundy Farms and Murray, sixth grade on both teams, and we bust the kids in from Burgundy Farms to play one afternoon. We did it on outdoors with tables and stuff. And these kids just started going out and playing. And so at the end of it, the championship round was my son Mike playing the best girl from the other school, and it was this big tense match. There were like 70 kids around standing on the table, and everybody was cheering. It was like a game where you play playing time stamp. It was amazing. And at the end, Mike won, and they put him on our shoulders, and they carried him back to the bus, and it was like the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was incredible. So I knew we were on to something. So then I said, we're going to commercialize this game and turn it into math dice. Um, the next year, we went to Barnes & Noble. We got eight Alexander. signage of the Barnes and Noble people came out and did this whole thing. Again, it was this big competition. This is the, uh, the championship round. And in this particular one, all the kids surrounding it, incredible tension. And here's me like announcing the winner at the end. It was like this huge emotional loop line. And this was the first time we also instituted a school spirit award. We had it be Tom McCoskey. We gave out the rubber chicken award. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you what, this is like, you know, this was just fun. And this was just hanging out. This we got a game, we got a product out of it, and I learned an incredible amount about game education. So it was just awesome. So um, there was a lot of other the decade of the 2000s was a kind of a fun decade in general. That's one of the reasons I was off doing this kind of stuff. It was not a terribly creative decade. Um, this, you know, in the education system, there was no child left behind, and it was teach to the test, and it was, you know, the standards and stuff. We tried a number of things to, to bring our games into system, it basically it kind of failed, and it was really a frustrating experience by that, but that's, you know, I had, I learned a lot, and, you know, fine, I just kind of took failure and licked the wounds, and the experience of doing this stuff, I figured this is like, you know, salty white nuts for later, so um, it was perfectly fine, and then the recession hit in 2008, and so it was really a matter of sort of, you know, pulling your horns and figuring out what to do next, um, but the world didn't stop. Recession was one thing, but coming out of the recession, all of a sudden you had new technologies that were coming. So the iPad for for us was probably the most uh, devastating uh, thing that you know got our, that, that could have really taken down our company uh, because it was just such an amazing new piece of technology. I think it came out in 2010, and then it started coming out a few from there. So we had games like. 
playtest, for example, that played with a tabletop and tokens that you put on and then a deck of cards where you set the thing up and do it. And with games like this that can be played more effectively and with more fun on an iPad screen than they can physical. But our games physical were selling for 20 bucks and with an iPad you're lucky to get 99 cents or be able to give it away for free. Um, it was just a whole different thing. It was like a devastating potential model that was coming into the decade of the teens which we live now. The other thing that happened And there were a lot of companies like our, and certainly a lot of toy stores that were just devastated by these new technologies. And, you know, they, you know just, that's just what happens when, when the world changes. And the issue is how do you get ahead of it? And um, we managed to find a way, you know, we really put some creative energy into it. Uh, our laser maze game, for example, um, you know, we call it the game of the frickin' laser. And, uh, that's not something that you can uh, emulate in an iPad. Well, I mean, it's like, I want to play my game with a laser. You know, it's like, you can't do that or not. You can, but it doesn't, it's not the same. Um, and then uh, the Gravity Maze also, which is highly tactile. We've got a really hands-on, three-dimensional. Uh, these games put more technology in. They were more expensive. They were $30 games. I remember saying you can only do a $20 game. But all of a sudden, we had a story to tell. And when you have a story to tell, that's when Amazon comes in. Because everybody looks at the story, and then you just go click through on the, the Amazon and you're off to the races. And so we had, suddenly, we had invented a whole new way of doing games that wouldn't be emulated on the iPad. They were higher priced that you could sell through more than toy stores because you could get the marketing out that you could talk about, you know, in the press and get people, you know, interested. And uh, with Amazon, the, what we call the path to purchase was dramatically shortened because you just, instead of having to remember to go look at it in a toy store two years, you know, two months down the road, you read about it and you just go click search and all of a sudden you're on the product page and you can buy something. So that was um, coming into the decade of the teens, no longer, I mean a lot of things were changing and um, you had to be faster on your feet to get you close to where we are now. So the last story I want to tell is about, it's kind of a, a work in process, so I'm going to go through it kind of, not sort of fast, but um, I don't have all, I, I can't take that is, um, a year ago, the uh, game buyer for Target came to us, and we were doing great business with Target. And he said, okay, so can you guys invent a series of games that teach coding principles? Uh, coding is big, and um, you know, Target, you know, I know it's a little bit of a rough sell, and it's not necessarily a mass market like some of these commercial games are, but we really believe that you know, kids in the world need to learn coding, and we want to make the Target brand stand for something. You guys are the ones to create coding games for us. Um, and we were like, yeah, we can do that. That's great. And knowing what I had learned about kids, which is that if you respect them, they can do a hell of a lot more than you think. And you know, all the passions and everything that came with it, we, I, I got an incredible inventor that's been working with me for a long time, and we created a series of coding games that will launch this summer, meaning the fall of 17 and the holiday, be in Target. Um, and there are three of them, and they're like totally awesome. And so I can't show you the whole game because they're a little too complicated, but I can show you the principles. So one of the games, the, the kind of the essential piece of it is a flow chart, we call it a challenge course. But basically, you have to work your way through and you look at this thing and, and it runs a map and you go ahead and do it. But this particular one that we're seeing is a wild loop that contains three instructions. And this one uh, is a different challenge. But it's a uh, while not, which contains an if then else. And, you know, there's going to be a balance between telling the kids what it is, and in some sense, I think I want to tell them what it is because it's pretty freaking cool. But the other thing is just this beautiful visual that uh, as you're sort of going through it in your mind's eye and trying to play with it, your experience, I mean, you know, you're either going this way or you're going that way, and then you're coming back together. That's what an if then else is. So the whole idea is that we're going to try and get it so the kids start building a mental model about how this stuff works, and getting a sense of things flowing through as they play, and then the play itself is what's the fun about learning the coding game. 
opportunity for us to do that is to say, if you want the real thing, go to Target. Um, and you know, what a great opportunity to get something out of the world and have a factor like that, just a commercial push behind it. Now, the final game, uh, the, the, one of the other games, the, the third game that I want to talk about, is called Robot Repair. And basically, this game is built on six Boolean logic gates. And um, so, a, a mini game that would come out of the real game is a little bit more complicated. But this is a game where you start out with a NOR statement, and you have to, it's a truth table, basically. You have to build it and get the AND to, to you know, resolve the truth. And so for this particular one, what this is saying is that you can't power up the green bar, and you can't power up the purple bar. And if you look at it, the green is attached to one and two, and the purple is attached to two and three. So you can't power up either one, two, or three. And so the question is, when you put your power node on, where are you going to put it if it's not one, two, or three, and you've only got four choices? So it's an easy concept to play as a game. You just have to get over the idea that you're dealing with a set of logic gates that are Boolean truth tables, which sounds really kind of crazy, but if it's just a game that you're playing, why not? Um, so uh, and here's another one that combines a, a what is it, an X or an OR statement, and we can combine all of these. We can start simple, and then we can move on, and then it turned out that the game rules are playing on Boolean logic gates. So the idea is that by playing these games, we're going to get kids comfortable with doing this stuff. And right now, I can tell you that there, the whole computer science uh, education side for kids is getting to the point now, it's, it's starting to embed in the school system. And this summer, they're coming out with the first set of standards for computer science education. And they're going to be per made permanent this fall. And nowhere in those standards do they even talk about logic games. I think it's because they think that the idea is that it's, it's too esoteric and not even available for the college level. But we're hoping to get fifth graders like talking about these conversion, which is a really exciting idea, which brings me back to when this idea showed up, what did I think to myself? So I thought, oh my God, I'm going back to my movies that I used to keep them around. So anyway, so that's the story of our thing. Um, I, I, you know, a couple of comments I just want to make at the end, thinking about business and everything. My business is different than, than your business and the, the business models and how it works. But you know, reflecting over the last, we've been in business for 32 years. The decade of the 90s was one thing was kind of a go-go decade where anything goes. The decade of the 2000s was kind of a really a, a hunker down decade where there was an awful lot that didn't happen. Um, this decade is one where there's an incredible amount of things that are opening up, consumer attitudes are changing, social media, you've got people learning to communicate, you've got personalization, you've got Kickstarter, you've got all kinds of things going on. I mean, this is an amazingly creative time that we are living in now. Okay? Thanks. It's an amazingly creative time that we're living in now. But, you know, I can't help but reflect that, so if, if, you, if you think about it sort of roughly speaking, every decade or so, things transform. Here we are in 2017. I kind of think that we are just at the beginning of what is going to be a transformation in the next couple of years to a whole different world. You've got AI, you've got augmented reality, you've got uh, personalization, you've got an entire economy and you know the consumer populace is now into social media and, and just has a whole new way of thinking. And I'm not sure where the world's going, but I can tell you it's not. I mean, it's going to be wherever it's going. It's going to be going fast, um, and that's really fascinating. You guys are getting into the business of making games and building yourselves out as entrepreneurs and trying to figure out a world at a time when things are changing really rapidly, which is like terrifying and incredibly exciting at the same time. And um, I think that that's totally awesome. So I want to put a shout out to everybody who's in this space and doing it and just say, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for you and I hope uh, you take away <coughs> something from what I've been doing. And
Thank you.